Grand National is the best wooden roller coaster in the United Kingdom, and it has a case as the world's best racing coaster. Located at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, this is a historic ride that's violent in a good and a bad way. It has some crazy airtime, but it also can beat you up if you're not careful. In this video, I will explain why this ride is so good, for me at least. Pleasure Beach has always had a fondness for wood coasters. Their first 10 coasters were all made of wood. The park added wood coasters in three consecutive years in the 1930s. All three would be designed by Charles Page, and these are the only rides from him still operating to this day. First was Roller Coaster in 1933, which is now known as Nickelodeon Streak. Second was Zipper Dipper in 1934, which is now known as Blue Flyer. Third was Grand National in 1935. This ride was considered wilder than those two rides, as it was known from day one for having incredible airtime. The layout was inspired by Long Beach, California's Cyclone Racer, and it is significant for being just one of two Mobius wood coasters still in operation, with the other being Racer at Kennywood. This is a special type of coaster where two tracks are connected, forming one single track or Mobius Loop, and Pleasure Beach still dispatches both sides concurrently, so the two sides still race each other. The name is derived from the Grand National Horse Race, which is arguably the most famous horse race in the world. Myself and most of my US viewers are probably familiar with the Kentucky Derby. That gets 6 million viewers annually. The Grand National, meanwhile, gets 500 to 600 million viewers annually. It is a big deal just like this coaster, as it is protected by the English government as a Grade 2 listed building. It is one of just a handful of rides in the country to earn that honor. Naming a racing wood coaster after the Grand National race is fitting, and the ride passes underneath several signs during the layout stating different racing horse terms or features in the actual Grand National course. You can see the start and end of this coaster from within the park's boundaries, but much of the layout is hidden behind Valhalla, so you need to exit the park to see most of the ride. As with most classic wood coasters, this ride is a white support structure. It could use a repaint, but the secluded location may deter the park from doing so. Also not helping with the aesthetics is that the park has a junkyard in the center of the ride. The coaster has an impressive entrance though. It is a tall vertical sign bearing the ride's name and I'm glad we can still see this sign today. In 2004, a devastating fire broke out at Grand National. This burned the ride station, parts of the track, and the trains. The fire also spread to the adjacent Alice in Wonderland and Trauma Towers attractions, but Grand National received the brunt of the damage. Firefighters had to use water from both Valhalla and River Caves to extinguish the flames before it spread further. Grand National reopened towards the end of the 2004 season, and it has run ever since. Today, the coaster operates with three car, three bench trains, so each train sees a max of 18 riders. While the park is four trains, and could run two on each side if they chose to, they almost never do. This ride typically has just one train per side, I have not heard of a time when they have just one train total running. Dispatches are not the fastest. To be clear, it is not the crew's fault. This coaster is a long cycle time and separate load and unload platforms. The latter are helpful on rides using multiple trains per side, but they slow down operations with just one train per side because guests enter and exit in two separate steps. Then there is just one attendant checking the restraints on each side. That being said, weights for this coaster are usually manageable. Part of that may be that people cannot see the coaster from within the park, so it may not be on their mind until they cross the entrance. So it doesn't matter too much when you try to ride it. The ride often has a full queue, but that is just a 15-20 to 20 minute wait. This is because the ride physically does not have much queue space. It is cramped and wedged in between the load platform for the two tracks. And while you're waiting, you'll hear the audio spiel telling you this is a wonderful ride over and over again. If you have the speedy pass skip the line system, 
you are routed up the exit and join the end of the queue. Everyone can then select their side and seat. While the attendants encourage people to fill the station front to back, this is mostly due to how narrow the load area is. You are allowed to choose a row further back in the train, as long as you let people squeeze past you. The back car is the best place to ride Grand National. The airtime is considerably stronger back there. However, you may want to avoid the very back row, or any wheel seat for that matter. Wheel seats are the back row, or third row of any car. These rows get their names because your butt is directly above the wheels, meaning you will feel any bump or imperfection far more harshly, and this ride has some downright brutal valleys, some of the roughest of any wood coaster. People can genuinely come off this ride in agony. This roughness is believed to be the main reason why this coaster's height limit has increased multiple times in recent years. For many years, riders need to be 46 inches or 117 centimeters tall to ride Grand National. That is on par with a lot of other wood coasters, but this was raised to 52 inches or 132 centimeters in 2022, then was increased further to 55 inches or 140 centimeters in 2024. I think this may now be the greatest minimum height for any wood coaster in the world. This ride's roughness is no joke, and the park knows that. The experience is far more tolerable in the front two rows of a car. You'll still shake, but you will not feel like your back is being broken. That is why my preferred places to ride are the second or third to back. You get the same fantastic airtime at the very back row, but you will not come off in pain. As for which side is better, the left side usually wins. I also find one hill noticeably better on that side as well. Now let's talk about the trains. These have changed quite a bit through the years. Originally, this coaster had absolutely no restraints, not even a seatbelt. And if you've ridden Grand National today, you know that has a downright terrifying thought. Later, the coaster received trains more similar to those on Big Dipper and Nickelodeon Streak. Rather than having three four-bench cars, the coaster had four three-bench cars. However, the trains were shortened to just three cars in the 1990s, presumably due to roughness and or wear issues. These trains had seats that were much deeper than trains from other wood coaster manufacturers. They are well padded. Then riders were secured by a shared lap bar, similar to the ones found in Morgan Wood Coaster trains. Shortly after the fire, this coaster received updated trains. These were provided by Philadelphia Toboggan Coasters, or PTC. The seats look similar to the old ones in terms of seat level and padding, but there are now seat dividers, individual seat belts, and individual ratcheting lap bars. These can be considerably more restrictive than the old restraints if they are jammed down, but the crew has never stapled me in my visits. That being said, the forces can try to staple you, so you may want to hold on to your restraint once checked. It is also worth noting that all your belongings must ride with you, bags included, so I highly recommend looping the ladder around your feet. It is quite unnerving feeling your bag go airborne in this ride's drops, because as I said earlier, this ride some legit airtime. I also love how the current trains still have headlights. These look really cool at night, and this is a theme with the park's wood coasters. And I'm glad the headlights are still operational, unlike a lot of other old woodies that still feature them. Once dispatched, you round a corner and line up with the other side. You then have a straightaway underneath the midway. Then you ascend a 62 foot or 19 meter tall lift hill. This narrowly makes it the park's tallest wood coaster. You pass multiple signs on the way up warning you not to stand up, which is a remnant from the days this coaster didn't have any restraints. Once at the top, you have a slow turn to the left. This brings you to the initial drop, which is a double down. The first hump is no negative G's. It exists solely to build up speed. The second dip is amazing though. This offers good floater throughout the whole train, but this is accompanied by a falling sensation if you're in the back car. It feels like the floor is pulled out from underneath you as you are yanked downwards. 
it sort of reminds me of the Double Down Jack Rabbit at Kennywood with more restrictive restraints, except this coaster is way more to it afterwards. The valley is very bumpy, which is a recurring theme with Grand National. To avoid sounding redundant, I will bury the hatchet now. Every valley in the first half is very bumpy, but if you avoid those aforementioned wheel seats, they are at least tolerable for me. Next is a large turnaround. You get an okay pop into the element in front. The turn itself is slow, but it allows the inside train to pass you, and you'll see people from opposing trains slapping hands. This leads to the ride's single largest drop. It is a straight plunge offering a good ejector pop in the back car. It is drops like this that make me wonder how this ride could have operated without any restraint for decades. Next is a large camelback. Those in front get a good burst of negative Gs. Then those in back get a solid ejector pop going down. I recall it being quite a bit stronger on the left side. You then jump up into another big turnaround. Those in front get decent floater. Then the turn is faster than the first, so you get some laterals this time. The inside train may or may not pass the other train, but it will make up considerable ground at minimum. Then the resultant drop is one of the better ones on the ride. It offers a great ejector pop in the back rows. Next is my favorite hill in Grand National. It starts off as a normal camelback, piercing through the supports, but the opposite side is a surprise double down that plunges into a subterranean pit. This caught me completely off guard in my first ride because you could not see it. Those in front get a good pop over the top and a little floater on the second hump, but this element is incredible in back. You get nice sustained floater over the top, but there's a kink that catapults you even higher. Then you get another abrupt jolt of air time in the second hump. I love how weird and untamed the negative G's are in this hill. Then you hop into another turnaround. It offers a really good pop of air time in front, the strongest such moment on the ride in that seat. Then the turn is exciting. It offers nice laterals and cool visuals. It's tucked underneath the first, so you have plenty of head choppers. And you have the racing element where the inside train pulls away. Then the subsequent drop offers a decent burst of airtime and back. Now it's time for the return run. This consists of a series of bunny hills hugging the ground. The first does nothing. The second has a double pop of airtime in front, and a solid pop in the back. This is a fun hill but it sadly is the last one on the ride with any negative Gs. You then have an L-shaped turnaround. You barely rise into it. This offers good sustained laterals. All the turns in this ride are unbanked, but you take this one with way more speed because it is at ground level. The left side, which is now on the inside, will take an insurmountable lead. You then have two mild bunny hills and rise into a brake run. This slows you way down. The train then gently dives underneath the midway and meekly rises upwards. You then roll back into the unload platform, ending the 3,302 foot or 1,006 meter long coaster. That is the length per side. That is a lot of track length for a coaster that is not overly tall. That ties into another con with this coaster, the finale. While the first two thirds are great in between the airtime and racing element, the finale falters a bit. The final hills lack the negative G's of the prior ones. This would be masked if the two trains were consistently side by side at this point, so you'd at least have a good racing element. But the race is usually decided by this point, at least on the rides I've had. One other word of caution. Your experience with this coaster can vary by weather. I got great rides during the day, but my evening rides were noticeably slower once the temperatures dropped. The experience I described reflects my daytime rides I've usually received. So, what would I rate the Grand National? I would give this coaster an 8 out of 10. This is a great wood coaster, if you ride in the right seats. The back car has some excellent airtime. However, this ride is quite bumpy and borderline painful in the wheel seats. So make sure to avoid those and you'll have a pleasant experience. Then this coaster also dabbles in some laterals 
and the racing helm is super cool. The latter is always a treat, given how rare it is. But again, the airtime is what stands out most to me. As I said at the start, I think this is the UK's best wood coaster. Megaphobia is probably the more well-rounded ride, but I think Grand National has more character and the more forceful airtime. That is why I prefer it, but it is close. So those are my thoughts on Grand National at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Do you agree this is the country's best wood coaster? Or do you find it too rough? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you consider subscribing, because there will be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.